Hello and welcome. I'm Ladani Umori. And I'm Tom Izu. We're both volunteers with the UI Kai Lecture Series, which started in 2017. And this afternoon, we're very excited to be your young looking Sansei, third generation Japanese American senior host for today's program. It's also going to be an opportunity for you to learn some Japanese words. So let's get ready for where's the opposite <laughs> next so what is okazu according to the extensive research conducted by the ui kai lecture series team involving one of us looking it up on wikipedia and another of us independently confirming its ac accuracy by doing this it is a side dish to accompany rice so from this, we gather that because rice is historically central to the Japanese diet, anything other than rice is not a main dish, but a side dish. Well, that's interesting, just a side dish, but I, I just thought of rice as a side dish. Yes, this was surprising to me too, but I think it might have something to do with our experience as Japanese Americans and our particular history in, in the US. Disclaimer, this is not based on our extensive Wikipedia research. From my own family stories, I have different definition. It is, I quote, a dish created utilizing whatever vegetables you can scrounge up, flavored with whatever else you can find in your kitchen, knowing it'll have to last for the entire week. And nobody better complain because at least you're not starving. You see, going back to the early 1900s, my Issei grandparents' lives evolved around small scale farming, or field and orchard labor work. So they weren't exactly living lives of luxury and excess. Uh, and Issei is first generation Japanese American. Hmm, not sure about that, Tom. And you're not making okazu sound very appealing for our audience. Yes, but this is the interesting part. I think our families use their creativity and immigrant survival skills to make things tasty regardless, or at least some of the time. No offense, Obachan and Ojichan. Besides, I'm talking about day-to-day -day stuff, not the fancy festival food families had on special occasions like New Year's, for example. All right, Ojichan, Obachan, grandmother, grandfather. Well, it's a good thing that we have six local young looking senior guests today who actually know what they're talking about, who will share Okazu, their family stories and their never before family recipes that will make your mouth water bring a smile to your face, and bring fond and respectful feelings to your heart about your family's culinary history. It's a good thing that we're presenting this program after lunch. I hope you've already eaten. Next. Next. I know once you hear these stories and see the yummy dishes, you will be scrambling for a way to quickly write down the recipes. But no need to worry. We will send all of you who registered for our program a copy of the recipes by way of email. So just sit back and enjoy. No need for any frantic scribbling or desperate typing. Next. So our first Okazu story storyteller is Warren Hayashi. Warren has been a volunteer in our community for many years, including the Japanese American Museum of San Jose and UI Kai, among many other organizations. Next. Warren was born in Vacaville, California, and after Gila internment camp days, lived on his family farm in the Santa Clara Valley near where Mission College and Great America Amusement Park are currently located. Uh, unfortunately, the pear orchard is no longer there. Next, we will have Warren sharing his recipe about making pickled mustard greens. Roll it. As far as things like skim uh, when we arrived in Santa Clara, my mom right away saw the the fields right inside, you know, right our, next to our house uh, with all these mustard greens. And she knew how to, what to do with those. And so she had us, when we were little kids, go out there and pick the tender part of the plant, not the 
not the main stem because the stem is too coarse to chew but the tender part she would get us she would gather a big basket full of them and uh, she would make skimono with that here's the recipe for warren's mustard green skimono you'll need one bunch of mustard greens two to three tablespoons salt or two taste half cup of water one half to three quarter cup brown sugar or you can use a handful of raisins instead of the sugar wash the mustard greens cut off any dry or yellowish tips cut into one inch pieces sprinkle about two or three tablespoons salt making sure all the leaves have been sprinkled with salt add one half cup water put into a press to squeeze and press the mustard greens. If you don't have a press, cover the mustard greens with a plate and set a heavy can or rock on the plate. Put in refrigerator and continue to check and squeeze or press the mustard greens. Massage the mustard greens. After about one to two days in the refrigerator, add sugar or raisins. Put back into the refrigerator. It should be ready to eat in a few more days. You can use the same method for other vegetables like eggplant, cucumbers, carrots, and daikon. Itadakimasu! Okay, so... Yeah. You heard the word, oh, you heard the word itadakimasu. That means before you eat, I'm going to receive this delicious meal. You know, this makes me want to go outside and see if I can find any greens to put under a big rock. It looks so wonderful. But most of the weeds in my yard don't look like as anything as nice as Warren's mustard greens. I'm also wondering if anyone in our audience inherited the family pickling rock. Shame to say that I think I lost my mom's. Oh, okay. And I just wanted to say those pickled vegetables, usually you eat it with rice as opposed to putting it on a tuna fish sandwich, okay? <laughs> So pretty sad, Tom, um, yeah. about you losing the rock, but um, on to fusion okazu cooking. Yeah, what's that? I, I don't think I've ever found that in Wikipedia for sure. Okay. All Next. right. Next, please. So the definition of okazu, oh, Fusion okazu, it's what happens when you combine an ingredient or style of cooking from one culture with another culture. Today we'll find out about two fusion okazu dishes, tomato udon and a Japanese tofu frittata with our next okazu expert, Joyce Oyama. Next. Joyce uh, is, is going to tell her story about her early fusion cooking. In 1948, many Italian and Portuguese families became Joyce's neighbors when her family bought property on Murphy Road. And this is the property shown here, I believe. Her mother would incorporate Italian style cooking and ingredients into her okazu dishes. And fusion okazu was born. And the picture here is of her farm. She grew up in the Barry Essa area, now surrounded by housing developments. So. Now let's hear from Joyce herself and follow by Margaret Tomita and another UIKI volunteer, her granddaughter, Tabitha, on a cooking one of Joyce's specialties. Please roll the film. My mother had a large home vegetable garden. She grew Japanese vegetables like gobo, daikon, snow peas, and mizuna, so she could cook Japanese dishes for the family. Okazu was a weekday item. After working in the fields, it was fast. We used whatever was available in the fields. At one time, we grew crops of lettuces, romaine, butter lettuce, red lettuce, escarole, endive, bib lettuce. When we wanted to eat salad, we went out and picked what we wanted, nice and fresh, no middleman. 
We had an Italian farmer next to us, and we used to get lots of tomatoes and corn from him. We canned lots of whole tomatoes, stewed tomatoes, and tomato with green beans. We even made our own ketchup. My mother made Western-style okazu. She made stuffed bell peppers with ground beef, corn, rice, and tomatoes. She made stuffed eggplant with white sauce, topped with small cubes of Velveeta cheese and cracker meal with a dash of paprika for color. She made this okazu that was really good, tomato udon. We called it Japanese spaghetti. I guess you could call it a fusion dish. Her tomato udon was more like a soup. She didn't use the recipe, but here is what I remember. She was good at flavoring, and I was not. She told me, just throw this in and that in. I would ask, how much? And she would say, just throw it in. My mother was a great cook. She even won a prize for her tofu omelet. The recipe was published in a Japanese magazine. Hi, I'm Margaret Tomita. Our chef today is Tabitha, my granddaughter. She loves to cook, and she looks forward to making Joyce's mother's prize-winning tofu omelet okazu. You forgot the word delicious. Oh, I'm sorry. Prize-winning delicious tofu omelet. Let's get started. Here are the ingredients for tofu omelet. Joyce's mother's omelet was plain, but today we will add a few vegetables for taste and color. One half cup of zucchini, half cup of onion, red pepper, and shiitake. The seasoning is one fourth cup of dashi with two teaspoons sugar and two teaspoons of shoyu. One block of tofu, three large eggs. Tabitha squeezes the tofu in a cotton cloth. Squeeze as much water out as possible. She mashes the tofu with a fork. She whisks the three eggs until combined. Heat a pan until hot, add one tablespoon oil. Cook the onions first until softened. Add the other vegetables to the pan and add seasoning. Cook until softened. Add the tofu and cooked vegetables into the bowl with the eggs. Season with half a teaspoon of salt. Add the mixture to an 8 inch nonstick oil pan at medium high heat. Tabitha is using a cast iron pan like Joyce's mother. Lower the heat, check in 5 to 10 minutes to see if the omelet is ready. It should puff up and have a golden color at the bottom. Cover the pan. Let's try it. What do you think? Well, it's delicious. I agree. Let's make it again. I can't wait. Eat a ducky mas. Thanks to Margaret and Tabitha, our UI Kai Lecture Series Dynamic Cooking Mother Duo. You know, LaDonna, I'm feeling really proud about having our Japanese American style of okazu as part of my heritage. Making do, being creative, incorporating new spices and traditions from others to help feed our families. Joyce and her mom, real trendsetters out of necessity, and I bet many other ethnic communities of color have similar folk fusion recipes and stories that should be better recognized and appreciated. Now on to our next okazu expert, Shirley Miyahara Kodani, who will share recipes using daikon, a type of radish, and kampyo, a type of gourd. Shirley is a longtime volunteer with UI Kai. Next. Here is Shirley's family farm home in Berryessa area of San Jose. Pictured in the insert is her mother and father at a farm, um, at the farm from a San Jose Mercury news photo published in the 1960s. Shirley says her mother was very embarrassed about this photo because farm work wasn't considered to be high status, but we're glad and proud for her representing us now. They originally grew all sorts of vegetables, spinach, chards, green onions, kale, well, many more for local markets, including Cosentinos. And Shirley says all of the kids had to work very hard and very long hours to help out. Next. 
uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Hikati Farms in Watsonville that provided the daikon for our demonstration coming up and for the recent do-it-yourself takawan making kits offered through UIKai as a fundraiser. And now for Shirley's daikon and kampio recipes. Roll it. Here are the steps to make dried, shredded daikon. Grate the daikon, clean it thoroughly. There is no need to peel the daikon. Squeeze the water out of the daikon to make it dry faster. Spread out the shredded daikon and leave it out in full sun to dry. It will take about two days. This is what it looks like when dried. You can use the dried daikon to make a seasoned daikon okazu. To make daikon okazu, reconstitute the dried daikon in water, saute the daikon and age in oil, add seasoning and simmer until the liquid is absorbed. Itadakimasu! Now let's make furo fuki daikon. Peel the daikon and cut it into 3 4 inch slices. Put the daikon slices in a pot. Add water to cover and sprinkle with kombu dashi, which is a powdered kombu as shown. Cover the pot and simmer until soft. While the daikon is simmering, make the miso sauce. Combine miso, sugar, mirin, and dashi and mix thoroughly. Cook for about 20 minutes until slightly thickened. Once the daikon is soft, remove it from the pot. Spread miso sauce on top and sprinkle with goma. Itadakimasu! Shirley will now show us how to make kampyo from scratch. Kampyo are dried strips from the calabash gourd. Shirley grows her gourds from seeds. Kampyo is an ingredient commonly found in sushi. She removes the stem and skin from the gourd. She cuts the gourd into one half to three fourth inch strips. She then hangs them out on racks to dry. Here is a dried kampyo strip. Shirley freezes her strips and says they keep for years. Shirley adds seasoned kampyo to her sushi. Nori has two sides. Make sure you have the shiny side on the outside. Itadakimasu! A, a funny thing I'll share is that when I was a kid, I used to poke out the insides of that sushi that I didn't like. Um, I would just want to go over a few Japanese words that you might have heard. That kombun is a kelp or seaweed. Shiitake was referred to, that's a dried uh, mushroom. Uh, you heard the word Mizuna. I'm not probably saying it right, but it's a mustard green. Um, you heard the word Niding, which is a sweet rice wine. Uh, tofu, it's the soybean. Okay, so let's get started with the next one, which is Bob Kubo's Green Beans and Kabocha Okazu. So again, Greek deep gratitude to Shirley for sharing those recipes uh, and growing those giant uh, gourds. Uh, those recipes take a lot of time and patience uh, and with the drying. So you really need to appreciate all of that. Uh, I think I'm still going to get mine at the grocery store, but uh, just want to appreciate that. So our next Okazu expert is Bob Kubo. Uh, Bob was originally born in Tokyo, Japan, where he first became interested in cooking. Uh, he came to the U.S. when he was 21 years old. He learned from watching chefs in Japan cook the dishes he liked and came to appreciate how they selected particular vegetables based on the season that they were at the peak flavor. Bob currently works at UI Kai, delivering meals to our seniors every day. Are you noticing a pattern here? If you want to meet some interesting and talented people in our community, volunteer at UI Kai. Roll it.
Hi, my name is Bob Kubo. I will be sharing a basic okazu of kabocha and green beans. The ingredients are one small kabocha, some green beans, two cups of water, one teaspoon dashi no moto, two tablespoons sugar, one tablespoon shoyu. This is how to cut the kabocha. You take the stem off so it's easier for the knife to get in. See how easy? And to remove the bottom stem too, because you can't eat that, this is pretty hard. Okay, now you have the stems off, take the seeds out. And you don't really have to scrape too hard because it really does come right off. Okay, uh, then you want to make this into like thirds, so it's bite size, the way you want it. You want it bigger, you can. You want it smaller, you can, but I'd rather keep it about this size, so when you cook it, it's always cooked even. After that, you might you want to cut the corners. This is making it so that the dashi will soak into the kabocha a lot faster and it does make it look better that's it Sato. and show you Put it to one side. Okay. Cover the kabocha and green beans to make sure that they cook evenly and allow the steam to get out. I use parchment paper to cook the kabocha and beans. You can use foil or oshibuta to cover the vegetables. Itadakimasu! You can use the same method to make beef and asparagus rolls. You can also use other vegetables like green beans, gobo, and scallions. I use sukiyaki meat to roll the asparagus. Roll the beef and asparagus in flour. Pan fry until brown. Add the seasoning, one part mirin, one part sake, one part shoyu. I used one tablespoon each on this recipe. Simmer until sauce is gone. Itadakimasu! Well, LaDonna, right now I'm starting to get really, really hungry. I really like the uh, kabucha squash. And so, unfortunately for me, um, we don't have any kabucha ready. We just have weeds in my yard. But I want to thank Bob for the wonderful looking dishes he made. Um, Can I just add, um, yes, I was going to add that uh, some Japanese words again. He used the word sato, which is sugar, shoyu. That is your soy sauce sake that's the drink uh the japanese wine so you could use it for cooking and have a sake um also dashi no moto it's your uh seasoning for that broth that you're going to hear a lot and on that kapocha the squash the pumpkin my auntie actually made kapocha pie so instead of making a traditional pumpkin pie for thanksgiving she would make a kapocha pie it looked a little different it it, it had a greenish hue to it. It wasn't as orange as a pumpkin pie, but very oishi, delicious. Okay, next up we have Susan Hayase to share her famous potluck special, miso eggplant. Susan is a volunteer with the UI Kai and the Japanese American Museum of San Jose, as well as a co-founder of San Jose Nikkei Resistor. So my wife, and sorry we do not have a photo of our farm to show you. <laughs> I already told you about our incredible weeds in our yard including Bermuda grass and crab grass. But I don't think, and I sure do not hope, anyone has tried to make okazu out of those yet. So please, uh, let's see the next video. My cousin has a funny story about my late auntie Sadako and cooking. Uh, 
He says that she would freely change ingredients and amounts specified in the recipe and then when she or other people didn't like the results, she'd declare that it was a lousy recipe. So in this spirit, this is how I cook my favorite okazu to take to potlucks. It's called miso eggplant and it's, it used to have a recipe but because it's inconvenient to measure dollops of miso and because eggplants come in random non-standardized sizes, I basically just wing it. This is my son Kiyoshi helping me take a pretty photograph of all the ingredients. This recipe tastes good with long skinny nasubi or large Italian eggplants. Um, the large ones are the easiest to find so I used one of these here. The size and shape of the eggplant allows for individual creativity and meditation on geometry. Um, basically, I like to exactly cut the eggplant into three-quarter inch by one inch pieces. Um, I am just kidding. I just cube them into a size that appeals to you. Heat a couple of the tablespoons of olive oil in the pan. Uh, this cast iron pan is our favorite and we use a bamboo cooking spatula. So fry the eggplant, stirring it a little bit and drizzling with more olive oil as needed. How long? Uh, Tom says, until it looks like Japanese food. It doesn't take very long to get to this point. Green onions also don't come in standardized sizes. These onions came from a store that heavily packages its produce and I think they cut off too much of the green part. Uh, for this egg size of the eggplant, I used a little less than two green onions and saved a little bit for something else. Um, pro tip, I remember my mother advising me to cut the white part on the thin side and then to cut longer, longer pieces as you get to the greenest part of the onion. Add the green onions to the pan. Turn down the heat until you make the miso sauce. For the size of the eggplant I used, I scooped out some miso and then went back and measured it. It was about five tablespoons. I added some sugar and then I measured it at about four tablespoons. So mash the miso and sugar until it's all combined. Tom helped me by juicing the lemons. I added up adding a little more sugar after the lemon juice was added. If you only have a small lemon or just a half, it's okay to add water too until the sauce is of the right consistency, which is kind of like gravy. Uh, taste the sauce and adjust according to your preference. I always use a little something to add a little bit of heat at this point, either cayenne pepper or chili oil or togarashi pepper, uh, whatever is there or strikes my fancy. So turn the heat back on and add the miso sauce. I ended up reserving some as I'd made just a little bit too much with my non-measuring method. Stir just until it's heated through. Put the okazu in a bowl and sprinkle with toasted goma. This bowl was made by Tom's parents, Doug and Mary Easy. Using their bowls, even their early ones, makes the food taste better. This okazu tastes good hot, or room temperature, or cold. Itadakimasu! We eat this with brown rice. It's pictured here with part of our collection of ohashi rests, some of which were made by Tomio and Kiyoshi over the years. Thanks so much! I just wanted to add that miso is fermented soybeans, goma is your sesame seeds. And I just want to add that I've been to some potlucks where Susan uh, does bring this delicious, you know, eggplant dish. Uh, we get it when it's hot, but as she mentioned, you can eat it at room temperature and cold. So that's a great dish. Uh, and now that I have a recipe, I guess I could be making it for myself now. Um, and I will tell you this, that in the past, when there was leftover, I, I was not shy. I would take some uh, of her eggplant okazu home with me so I could share it with my husband, Mike. So as you can see, we're going to talk about dessert, but I'm actually not sure. Is that really okazu? What well, do you think, Madonna? I think the word okazu we're using as fresh, healthy, farm fresh. So the berries qualified and there's always room for dessert, right? Yeah, I just have a hard time imagining when my dad had to cook when I was growing up, his form of okazu was to take whatever's lying around and add bologna to it and fry it. Oh. I can't imagine him chopping up strawberries and frying it with shoyu and whatever else. But but I agree. I agree. Um, maybe let's see the next slide. So I think one of the reasons why we're sharing it, not only because we really strongly believe in dessert always, and of course, even our Issei pioneer work, hardworking uh, grandparents, um, they all enjoyed dessert from time to time. I'm sure they did. 
The other thing, though, is many of you might know, Japanese Americans uh, were one of the main producers of strawberries in, in the valley. Um, and to this day, they're, st they're still you know, strongly connected to the strawberry industry. Next. So Kathy Higuchi, she grew up in Watsonville, California, which is the strawberry capital, according to Kathy. Uh, her family was in the um, food industry. Uh, Kathy will share her Ichigo Daifuku. And again, Ichigo is strawberry. Roll it. Hi, today we're going to attempt to make Ichigo Daifuku, or strawberry mochi. You will need six strawberries, about one cup onko, a sweet red bean paste, three quarters cup of water, two tablespoons sugar, some cornstarch, and 120 grams of shiratamako. I've washed and cut off the hulls of six strawberries. You want them about the same size, so trim off from the bottom if some are larger. Next, measure out about two tablespoons of anko and form them into balls. You can buy anko at the Japanese grocery store, but it's really easy to make. I made this batch in an instant pot following a recipe from the Just One Cookbook website, and we'll be sure to include the link in our handouts. Now we're ready to cover the strawberries with onko. This will get a little messy, so you may need to wash and dry your hands in between each one. I first flatten the onko in the palm of my hand and place the strawberry in the center. Then I start molding the onko around the strawberry. Check to see that the strawberry is evenly covered. Once you've finished, set them aside. Now for your own little mochitsuki. We won't be needing an usu and kine, just a bowl and a microwave oven. But before we get started, it's important to prep a cookie sheet with cornstarch so it will be ready when we finish cooking the mochi. Dust your sheet pan with cornstarch until you have a thin layer. Keep a little mound of cornstarch ready for your hands. It's going to get really sticky. In a microwavable bowl, measure 120 grams of shiratamako into the bowl. This sweet rice is pebbly and very different from mochiko, which is a fine sweet rice flour. So make sure you have the pebbly one. Then add two tablespoons of sugar and whisk until thoroughly combined. Now add the water, a little at a time, stirring to completely dissolve the shiratamako. Keep stirring until all the lumps are gone and you have a slurry like this. Cover the bowl loosely with plastic wrap and get ready to microwave. Set your timer for one minute and start. After one minute, remove the wrap and stir the mixture. You can see it's already starting to thicken. We'll repeat the step for another minute. Now it's really beginning to look like mochi. You could stop at this point if your mochi looks translucent. Now the mochi is fully cooked and ready to cool. Scrape the mochi from the bowl onto the dusted sheet pan. It's really sticky, but try to keep it all in one piece. Dust the top with cornstarch. Remember to keep your hands dusted to prevent sticking. Now comes the tricky part. You want to pat the mochi down into a rectangle, which you will cut into six equal pieces. Keep patting and stretching the mochi until it looks something like this. Cut the mochi into six pieces. You need to keep working quickly or the mochi will get too stiff to wrap around the strawberries. Take each piece of mochi and stretch it out. Now we're ready for the last step. Place the stretched piece of mochi in the palm of your hand. Place the onko covered strawberry tip side down on the mochi. Now pull up the opposite corners of mochi around the strawberry and press them together until they stick. Repeat with the other two corners. Then keep turning the strawberry to pull up the opposite corners, all while pressing and twisting the mochi together. When the bottom is sealed off, carefully pat the strawberry into a nice shape and set it on the dusted sheet pan. Repeat until all six strawberries are done. It takes a bit of practice and some may look a bit misshapen, but they will all taste great. So if they don't look perfect, you can always cut them in half and then eat the evidence. Itadakimasu! 
Mm-mm. Would you stop it? <laughs> All right. So it's it's interesting about the um, people that grew the vegetables or the fruits. Um, asking them, they oftentimes said, you know, when Warren family group of the pears that is not his favorite fruit nowadays um i asked kathy about strawberries that you know her, her she was involved with it so you know it's interesting because you're surrounded by it uh i guess it it has a different take but i was going to say an interesting note was that when my mom was pregnant side note uh she ate strawberries but to this day strawberries are not her favorite fruit but it's my favorite so somehow maybe that got trans uh ported to me. Um, I, at this time, I think I just want to take a moment to thank those farmers that labored so hard to get that produce and, you know, provide the economy for our valley, for our state. Uh, the Japanese Americans contributed quite a bit uh, historically that's not always written in our textbooks. I know if, if I was a farmer today, we would be in trouble. But uh, I do have my green onions here in a pot, so we're more of a household farmer. Uh, you actually take a onion and just stick it in dirt. So I got mine at the farmer's market. So if you wanna do that, it's just nice to snip some green onions. All right, so at this time, we're going to uh, have the Q&A question and answer feature. So I hope you wrote in your, you'll write in your favorite Okazu recipe and any questions that you may have, and we'll get to those uh, as time permits. So please take a moment, write your favorite Okazu recipe or your favorite Okazu name um, and any questions that you have, and then Kathy will help us with the Q&A. Yeah, and at this time, maybe we can have the other panelists appear oh, if yeah. they're available because uh, they could probably help us ask, answer some questions. Um, I was just gonna say um, that uh, Jane uh, mentions that how much work making the, the dessert that Kathy put together. And even though she, she says she had to practice a lot, she made it look really easy, <laughs> really yummy. But um, Jane was saying, well, you know, if you don't think you can do it yet, you know, you can always go to Santo Market. I'm sure they sell that kind of that special mochi and I believe they do. So that's another option. It's just, just to help us really appreciate all the different things that you could do with these fruits and vegetables. And I'll just put in a plug for UI Kai, the nutrition program. So if you don't have time to make some okazu this week or next week, yeah. consider signing up for the lunch program for only $3. I've, I've used their services and the food is always oishi, delicious. Uh, so please uh, utilize the UI Kai services if you are in the San Jose area. Uh, because of Zoom, I know some of you are from out of town or maybe even out of state, so welcome. Great, so we do have a few questions that have popped up while we're waiting for people to share their okazu or their favorite okazu. Um, one was, uh, where can we buy the veggie presser that was shown in Warren's kimono uh, oh. demo? And so, um, I know I, I don't think Warren has joined us yet, but um, one answer, I, th I think Margaret, you might have some clue as to where we might find these. Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, you can get it locally at Koguda Market and they have round ones also. But I think if you go to any grocery, Japanese grocery store or dry goods store, you should be able to find the press presser and uh, there's always Amazon. Great. Uh I've seen it at Santo Market too. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So then, there's a couple. And then Kathy, I was just going to add, as Warren said, you get a bowl, you put you do <laughs> what, the then, rock. Yeah, and put a plate or something on it to press it, and you get that rock. And I really was not kidding. My mom had a rock that she used, and I don't know where it is anymore. So uh, I think every family has that rock, don't you? <laughs> we don't yeah. know where ours is either. Either. <laughs> Great. Okay, the uh, a next question had to do with what kind of knife was Bob using? He was the person doing the 
the kobacha uh, and green beans. And, and Margaret, I, I think you've got an answer for us too. He, he used a knife in the Uaikai kitchen. It's a cuisine art. It comes in different colors and you can get it at uh, TJ Maxx, I think sells it, maybe even Costco, but they're different colors for different sizes and shapes. So uh, very common knife, very reasonable priced. Great, great. And then uh, kind of associated with that was um, a question about, do you have to microwave the kobacha to make it easier to chop? And I know we were all kind of cringing <laughs> that that knife was going to slip. So um, is that a, a good thing to do? Uh, actually, uh, Nami from Just One Cookbook recommends if it's hard to microwave it for one mm. minute. And I find that's easier to cut if you microwave slightly. Ah, great. Great. Sounds good. Uh, oh, and another uh, pe person has asked, um, sadly, a family member doesn't like eggplant, but the miso sauce looks great, Susan. So have you ever made your okazu with other vegetables? You know, I, um, I guess I'm not that creative. I, I've never tried that. The, I think the only variation uh, that I've done is um, I added skirt steak. <laughs> but, I didn't, but I didn't remove the eggplant. <laughs> so, and so, nice. but I, you know, I bet you could uh, do it with a lot of different kinds of vegetables because actually just it occurred to me that uh, it might taste really good with um, like gailan, uh, Chinese broccoli. Uh, I really like that vegetable and maybe the, maybe that would taste good. Great, great. Yeah, that act, uh, and kind of a follow up. Are there, um, different types of eggplant do you know that you can use uh, to make your dish yeah actually so um there are so many kinds of eggplant actually like if you um uh, kind of your standard um, grocery store only has the big uh, italian kind but if you go to like whole foods they'll have like chinese eggplant japanese eggplant italian eggplant and, i mean there's a lot of different kinds um i've mostly used the the big italian ones or the nasubi um but uh, I, I'm probably not an eggplant connoisseur, but they're, they're all taste good. I love eggplant. So they all taste good to me. That's great. Yeah, let's see. I'm looking for another question. Ah, uh, regarding the strawberry daifuku, the regular mochiko flour will not work. And yeah, I know what you mean, that, that box we get from Koda Farms. No, apparently it will, the texture will be very different. So you have to find that, that kind of, that kind of pebbly thing. And oh, and you can get it at Najia, you can get it at, um, let's see, I think most of the Japanese grocery stores will have it. Marukai and Cupertino. So anyway, so yeah, so it's this kind of pebbly stuff. I think I got this one at Marukai. Anyway, okay. Thanks for the question. Kathy, there's a question in the uh -huh. chat. Um, oh, I'll great. read it. It says, thank you. The old Ginza restaurants, beef and beans, which I try to replicate, but still not to totally successful. Does anyone know the real recipe? It was so delicious. Ooh. That's by Joanne Kobori. Oh, yeah. This would be a great, yeah place to exchange these kind of things if, if anyone has any ideas. Look in the community cookbooks. Oh. Maybe it's in a church cookbook or, you know. That's a good idea. One other question that has popped up at times is um, sometimes a lot of recipes say to taste. And so, um, Margaret, we were wondering if, if you had some advice on that. I know you were uh, helping with many of the interviews or recipes with, with Joyce and with Shirley. So maybe they had some insights on that. Well, uh, dashi is sort of the mother sauce of Japanese cooking. And we know that seasonings vary by region to region. Okay. And so when we say to taste, you need to vary it based on the taste of your family, whether you add more or less or proportion of sugar to show you. So pretty much the taste that your family likes. Thanks. That's great. Good to know. Um, we got another question about the handouts being available. And, and yes, they will all be emailed out to you. So whatever you registered at, your, that email, 
the recipes and handouts will be sent to you. Okay, and a question. Will the green bean rolled and beef teriyaki recipe be included in the packet? And yes, that one is in there. Uh, it was actually, let's see, yeah. It was, he rolled the asparagus in the, in the meat and then he did the green beans with the kobacha, but um, both recipes there and from what I understand, vegetables are all interchangeable in these recipes too. You know, if we don't have any other questions, I um, right now I, I was just going to add one thing that really uh, appeals to me about this whole o Okazu talk is that uh, uh, Susan and I are involved in the Hidden Histories of San Jose Japantown Augmented Reality Art Project. And one thing that we had a discussion with um, a Filipino gentleman and the Chinese Americans uh, who, who lived in the area, and all, all of them also have some form of Okazu. And especially from in the 1930s time period, you know, in the depression, people were, including Warren was also part of the discussion, were sharing how they would find things in lots and farms and, and, and use them for various dishes. And each, each community had a different way to season them, but it was still Okazu. And unfortunately, I don't remember what the Filipino community called it and what the Chinese community at the time called their form of Okazu. And these are not fancy dishes, but... I think it's something we have in common with a lot of immigrant communities. And it's uh, very interesting how all these different things have been combined to create different flavors, so. I was thinking we kind of make okazu if you clean out your refrigerator, you know, at the end of the week, just making an okazu <laughs> soup or, you know, stir fry. So we are doing our own okazu uh, version of cooking. Um, I think it's not from the farm, it's the grocery store, and maybe even using a microwave to help us get through. But uh, yes, yeah, hopefully but, but, we're all eating healthy, healthy. Yeah, mm -hmm. but LaDonna, it sounds like your refrigerator is pretty clean. I'm not sure if I'd want to use the ingredients I know are in back. Oh, the oh my goodness. Okay, well, all right. I, I can barely wait till the pandemic is over so we can get to our community potlucks and enjoy sharing uh, the good food. And, you know, you see Kathy sharing her desserts. She's always been good about uh, preparing things. So um, mm -hmm. I look forward to that. So, and for us to get together with UI Kai speaker series in person too, because normally we would be doing these in person. Yes, our family had to eat a lot of strawberry oh. mochi because oh, I okay. couldn't um, share it. <laughs> um, there was a question about um, if this, this press, you know, we're recording the presentation. So uh, there were questions about where it would be posted so it can be viewed again. Um, Jane, can you, do you know where that will be? Um, usually it goes to a UI Kai in terms of either their website or on YouTube. I think the information will be shared. We, we should ask her about right. that. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. I was gonna hit on the- yeah. uh, Thank the you, Jane. Um, yeah, so um, we will be putting it, I think on the Japantown, the Jtown Community TV. And once that link is available, we'll email out to everybody who was uh, on the call today. Actually, anybody who registered. So if you did not register and you're on this call and you, uh, if you can send an email to me, um, uh, my email uh, should have been uh, the source for the, the uh, link to this call, um, but it's uh, jjkawasaki at yahoo.com. So hopefully in the next few days, the, the recording will be available on Jtown Community TV. Great. I don't see any more questions right now. Um, Susan, do you see anything in the chat? No, I think, I think we're set. Okay. Okay, well, why don't we go to our next slide? So at the end of the program, after you log off, a survey form will magically pop up. Please answer our easy and short survey. And re please remember as an added incentive, all participants who 
will receive a packet of seeds from the famous Kitazawa Seed Company if you complete the survey. This company started in San Jose, Japantown area in 1917. Now located in Oakland, they continue to produce a wide variety of seeds, including for many Japanese and Asian vegetables. And to use their, and they still use their iconic seed packets with the nice artwork. So complete the survey, get the seeds and the recipes that'll be emailed to you and no excuses. You can make authentic Japanese American style okazu yourself. Next. Joyce is going to share her uh, final thoughts. Uh, please enjoy these given by Joyce Oyama about farm life. It's important because we are tied to the earth no matter what. Even back from the caveman days, they had to rely on the earth for the food they ate, and we still do today. There's something about being tied to the earth. There's some kind of bond. It, it's there, and a lot of us take it for granted, and maybe we don't appreciate enough. We'd like to thank the following for their help in making Where's Okazu. We appreciate their support. It took lots of people. And thank you for coming. First, I want to thank all of you for watching Where's the Okazu. We appreciate your support and interest and hope you can join us at our next event scheduled for Saturday, August 7th with Veggie Lucian. You will see a, a slide about announcing this event and I'm really looking forward to it. Vegilution is a farm education program that connects people from diverse backgrounds through food and farming to build community in East San Jose. So everybody, eat tadakimasu. Eat tadakimasu. Thank you again. <laughs> eat your fruits and vegetables. Goodbye. Bye. Sayonara. Bye. And please do the survey. <laughs>